these are my reflections as a music theorist with a semiotic background on the problems of meaning and interpretation that I trust will be relevant to a number of disciplines. So fruitful interactions between music semiotics and other disciplines. One, introduction. Semiotics as a discipline. Semiotics is not an empirical science, nor is it merely an art of interpretation. It is a discipline that reconfigures the simplistic opposition between presumably objective, empirical, scientific, and subjective, interpretive, hermeneutic, modes of inquiry. How? By recognizing not only the presumably inherent properties of its object or subject of study, but also the defining interrelationships that object and subject has with others. Physics even has recognized this necessity at the level of particle theory. But the study of more complex organizational interactions leading all the way to human life has also led us to an appreciation of the concept of emergence, which can roughly be defined as those new organizations, interactions, and significations that could not have been predicated or predicted from lower levels. We have also begun to recognize that there may be more than one path to such understanding. Western science's systematic discovery of the mechanistic and chemical interactions in the living human body, while extraordinary in its findings, has not achieved a full explanation of the energy known as the chi, including its nodes and pathways throughout the body, as mapped over centuries by Eastern practices. Although Western science has confirmed the instrumentality of such related practices as acupuncture. And the puzzle of emergent consciousness is a phenomenon that continues to intrigue the best minds across the spectrum from the scientific to the philosophical and metaphysical. What is the role of semiotics in understanding a human practice such as music? Music semiotics is speculative, a speculative discipline that attempts to hypothesize the ways in which signification works. Parts of these hypotheses may well be subject to experimental testing, with the proviso that experiments cannot provide a complete explanation, but only a window into a complex human competency. Although scientific experiments on hearing and listening can offer initial evidence of cognitive constraints, the capacity for musical styles to achieve emergent forms of listening may transcend those constraints. A simple example for tonal styles is our ability to hear acoustically equivalent intervals, such as the diminished fourth and the major third, as diametrically opposite in their effect. One is dissonant and the other is consonant. So if you can go to slide two, our first music example, I'll go ahead and continue reading. The emergent difference between acoustically equivalent intervals is reflected in the distinctive spelling and scale degrees of the pitches involved. For example, in the subject of Bach's fugue in C-sharp minor, the dissonant diminished fourth is spelled B sharp to E, in other words, scale degree seven up to the lower third in C sharp harmonic minor. I'll play it. There it is. But that very dissonant interval going from the seventh up to the four, which we hear is a painful, tragic, grieving dissonance, <laughs> we could also reinterpret as C to E, B sharp being equivalent to C, but the interval of the diminished fourth is in no way expressively equivalent to the interval of the major third, and that's where we have the concept of emergence. <laughs> 
Another form of emergence is due to the triadic harmonic basis of Western tonality. Chord tones of root, third, fifth, and even seventh are relatively stable, such that the perfect fourth, ordinarily a consonance, is heard as unstable, needing to resolve to the relative stability of surrounding chord tones, as in this example from the Mozart Requiem. It's the voca me from the confutatis, and the sopranos and altos sing. And you can hear the move to the perfect fourth which resolves like a bass suspension to the tritone, the diminished fifth, which itself must resolve back to the major third. So a perfect interval, because it needs to resolve to the chord tones of the dominant seventh chord, is heard as a dissonance, whereas the dissonant diminished fifth relative to the perfect fourth is a relative consonance, which then is heard as the dissonance resolving to the consonance of the major third. Okay, so we'll see that example in a moment here. <clears throat> there are three factors that preclude a more empirical experimental verification of the competencies presupposed by a musical work and its style. They are one, historically grounded with intertextual historical resonance, even for current styles. They must be learned and the modality of musical meaning is not simply communicative, but entails the more speculative interpretation of aesthetic and expressive meaning. We cannot objectively verify a past practice if we must first historically and theoretically reconstruct it, which also entails learning emergent complexities and for the aesthetically warranted potential for interpretation, knowing that that is ultimately going to be very fluid. Nevertheless, musical semiotics, understood as a speculative discipline, has rigorous methods and ways of construing evidence that can help us reconstruct a historically grounded and aesthetically warranted competency, one that must be learned to a high degree of artistry by contemporary practitioners, performers, listeners, and even composers wishing to replicate a past stylistic competency. Although the reconstruction of underlying competency will not produce the equivalent of a grammar for language, it never is nevertheless possible to offer plausible explanations for the kinds of learned practices that underlie the transmission of meaning through musical experience. Two, modes of human signification and the reconstruction of a musical style competency. Thus, from a semiotic perspective, modes of human signification, from the referential to the expressive, and from language to music and the other arts, require more than objective dissection for their explanation. Such human competencies entail meaning, and hence interpretation. But the systemic regularities presupposed by these modes of thought and communication also require more for their reconstruction than a mere summation of interpretive acts. The building of deep structural theories that can account for contextually dependent exchanges among humans, from the immediacies of speech or performative encounters in music, to the readings and experiences of texts and scores produced prior to those encounters, requires a different kind of science, one that is regulated by the contexts of signification. Sem semiotics seeks to explain how such signification is possible. For historical music, semiotics attempts to explain how types of meaning might be compositionally staged and thus plausibly interpreted. First, 
within the contexts of musical styles, which I define here as those competencies presupposed by musical works that ground further interpretation of potential artistically rich meanings. This definition is a variant of one that I came up with in my dissertation in 1982. Since for music, referentiality and situationality are often indeterminate, we should not expect to discover explicit meanings, but rather an intricately designed channeling of more generalized reference and to compensate more precisely calibrated emotions or expressive meanings that constitute a stylistically warranted discourse or trajectory within which individuals can experience uniquely situated interpretations. Nonetheless, a speculative semiotic theory requires modes of interpretation that are adequate to the rigor of semiotic reconstruction. Here, Charles Saunders Peirce's concept of abduction, shared by science and hermeneutics, can be a fruitful guide. Abduction akin to the process of hypothesis formation, involves the speculative generalization of a principle to account for an act or event that may have appeared inexplicable on first encounter. With respect to aesthetic texts, observing regularities of practice, compositional formulae, schemata, patterns, etc., should lead beyond a kind of inductive reasoning based on statistics to a more creative abduction of the principles that underlie a competency as evidenced by those regularities. In other words, the deep structure of a style, not merely its surface manifestations. For an aesthetic text, however, we cannot assume regularities are necessarily constrained by strict rules or prohibitions, or that they are reflective of fixed norms. A rare musical event, however atypical, need not be considered anomalous if it can be understood instead as a unique realization of a regulative stylistic principle. For example, a recapitulation beginning in the subdominant is highly atypical with respect to the majority of sonatas in which the recapitulation is distinguished by large-scale tonal resolution to the tonic or home key. However, recapitulation in the subdominant key is not anomalous with respect to the principles of the style, and in fact, it is actually a simpler solution, since instead of having to rewrite the modulatory transition to stay in the tonic for the second theme, to resolve the second theme, one can simply play a transposed version of the exposition and the transition will modulate up a fifth from the subdominant to the tonic for the second theme. The principle of resolving the second theme in the tonic key in the recapitulation is thus preserved. Understanding the regularities of a style is also a step toward hypothesizing expectation or stylistic implications against which creative choices may be understood not as violations of rules, but as deferrals or denials of first expectation, Leonard B. Myers, 1956, or to move, as he did, from psychology to a more semiotic perspective, implications in his 1973 work. Implications that are stylistically valid modes of achieving greater expressive effects. Indeed, expressive motivations are often the driving force behind such apparent innovations. As Meyer first observed, if we expect a resolution that does not immediately occur, there will be an emotional charge as we respond to the deferred expectation or, as he later framed it, a deferred realization of a stylistic implication, a more cognitive approach in this way. The degree to which we experience emotion will be calibrated according to the degree to which the implication is initially denied. And we'll be moving up to slide four, so you could go ahead and put that up if you'd like. Example three. What I call a, a rhetorical gesture 
is one that breaks the unmarked flow of the discourse with a highly salient alternative. Consider this example. If there is a stylistic implication for cadence, as in 5-7 implying resolution to 1, and instead of 1 we hear 6, we understand the deferral as a stylistically typical but semiotically deceptive cadence. Then, thus, we would not react with great emotion, but instead recognize and interpret the delay as implying a one more time, one more time, that's Janet Schmalfeld's wonderful term, approach to that same cadence, this time resolving to the tonic. But if the denial of tonic is more dissonant, for example, a diminished seventh chord that has no logical syntactic function, then the cadence has been emphatically evaded and the rhetorical effect will be emotionally more profound. In this example, you will first hear a chromatically heightened deceptive cadence as five goes to seven, seven of six to six by the end of measure 18. So it's already strategically enhanced as a deceptive cadence. It's already a bit more salient than just a routine deceptive cadence. But after the one more time recovery in measure 19, the pianissimo measure, uh, to set up the implied cadence in measure 20, Beethoven instead substitutes a more startling evasion to a completely irrational diminished seventh chord in the downbeat of measure 20. After the surprise, now, this is what's interesting, Beethoven actually compositionally stages a fortissimo reaction in which the diminished seventh is now retrospectively rationalized by resolving on the third beat of measure 20 as a dominant to D minor, the two chord of C major. But instead of moving syntactically to five of C for a more typical restoration of the evaded cadence, Beethoven inserts another fortissimo reaction in measure 21, this time directly from D to C, interpreted as five of three or five of F, the relative major of D minor. This actually recalls a typical Baroque progression enshrined in the passamezzo pattern, forming the basis for innumerable Baroque variations. Beethoven imports it here, I believe, in order to suggest a sense of profundity due to the venerable status of that earlier style. But since five of F is also the same chord as one of C, Beethoven can simply reinterpret it in measure 22 to regain his deferred cadential setup. And this time he resolves it properly to the tonic in measure 24. So I will play this example and talk through it with you, starting at measure 15. Where are we? Response. Like a recitative. There's that Baroque gesture. And then recovering. The same as measure 19. And the third time is a charm. It would not have been appropriate for him to introduce still another diminished seventh, unless perhaps he was writing in a late romantic style, where Wagner keeps giving you those augmented evasions of cadence. See, what happens in measure 20 is more surprising even than the heightened deceptive cadence in measure 18 to, that was um, chromatically enhanced. And thus, we have a more intense 
emotional response, which is actually staged by Beethoven in the music. Virtual agency. Thus, the staging of expressive effects goes far beyond the mere mapping of melodic contours. The ascending line is iconic of upward motion, say, in measures 17 to 18. Or dynamic energies, if we consider the ascending line as indexical of rising emotional intensity. To embrace more complex emotional effects, in this example, Credential delays and evasions involving a more symbolic level of harmonic signification, which supports an emergent dramatic trajectory of, for, example, for instance, thwarted desire. Now, we don't know whose desire or what the context is for this thwarting, but then we can begin to understand in our own interpretations and add our own more specific emotional um, situationality, if you will, as we listen to this otherwise abstract, no, absolute in the sense of quintessentially emotional. For non-programmatic music such as this, there may not be any real life situation motivating a composer to stage such emotions. In fact, the composer may not be attempting to respond to any particular situation. Nevertheless, listening with the semiotic competency of one, or in this case, more than one musical style, remember the Baroque importation, the listener can both recognize and identify with such emotional scenarios, with the option to fill them with the particularity of any number of emotional experiences having a similar structure and grounding in that listener's actual life. There can thereby experience a unique emotional trajectory, but one that is nevertheless shaped by the demonstrable trajectories of the musical work as grounded in its style or styles. If shared by other competent listeners, we have not merely a subjective, but an intersubjective grounding for our claims about that experience, however generally we theoretically characterize it, meaning the experience of the emotional trajectory expressed by the work. In the reconstruction of this rich human competency, the notated score is but one form of evidence. The semiotics of music can fruitfully interact with other disciplines to help explain other contextually appropriate competencies with bearing on that musical experience. Dragged down by external forces, we may appeal to the human experience of agency in the first case or an analogy with effects of such physical forces as gravity in the second. And I'm thinking here of my own work on virtual agency and also Steve Larson's and Arnie Cox's work on physical forces and mimetic responses. We can draw upon the psychology of agency and the physiology of reactions to physical forces as we construct a virtual environment in which those forces act upon musical lines or sequences as they take on a virtual life of their own. So we have both the virtual environment and the virtual agencies acting within that gravitational field, if you will. The particular rhythmic, metric, melodic, contour, and dynamic shapes of musical events can also mime human gestures, including the qualitative fusion of imagistic and temporal gestalts as I discuss in my 2004 book, thereby providing an immediate insight into modalities of human emotion, for which David Lidov and Naomi Cumming are wonderful um, proponents. The intricate, detailed recognition of faces constitutes our imagistic capacity, immediate, where the gestalt patterning of a given person's walking style is captured by our temporal capacity. Oliver Sacks, in his 1985 famous case of the man who mistook his wife for a hat, illustrates how one might lose one capacity, the imagistic, seeing 
a hat on a hat rack with a coat and thinking it was his wife, um, but retained the other, the temporal. Apparently, the individual he studied could not recognize faces, but he could identify his, interestingly, voice students, not only by their singing, but by their walking signatures. So if he would see them coming down the hall, not by facial immediate recognition, but by temporal gestalt of the walking signature. Examples of imagistic gestalts in music include our immediate gestalt perceptions of timbre and chord quality. Think of the opening sonority of the Eroica. And their expressive shaping through time, through motives and melodies, as well as chord progressions, constitute our temporal gestalt. Now, it just so happens that musical gestures within a prototypical two-second boundary can integrate to the highest degree both imagistic and temporal gestalts. And that's what makes these gestures so highly memorable for their distinctive configurations, and it thereby enhances their affective force. Scientific studies of gesture and emotion can provide evidence for various types of gestures, ranging from the more conventional or emblematic, the peace sign, um, to the more spontaneous or from the immediacies of indexing, literally pointing to something, to more abstract forms of pointing, which I've been illustrating already in this lecture. I'm pointing to the concept I just talked about, as discussed by David McNeil in 1992. We can explore basic types of human emotion, as well as the processes by which emotions evolve in complexity. Thus, from more immediate physiological and cognitive responses to more considered stylistic and aesthetic appraisals, as further elaborated by philosopher and aesthetician Jennifer Robinson in 2005, and in our joint article for Music Theory Spectrum in 2012. We have seen how music theories have established hierarchies of closure and goal-directed motions as regulated by tonal syntax for the strategic exploitation of those implications that I described above, which can play with degrees of deferral and realization, as well as with degrees of repetition and variation. And the music psychologist here I would mention would be David Huron and uh, Elizabeth or Lisa Margulis, who's now at Princeton. And we can learn from current theories of inaction that engage listeners' own reactions. My formal doctoral student, um, uh, Brie Guerra, in what would have been a dissertation that I think would have been wonderful, um, has drafted a, a good deal of work on relating theories of inaction, as well as their ability to infer virtual agency. At still higher levels, we can explore analogies in music to the dramatic and narrative trajectories found in literature, with their implications for profound expressive journeys, including equivalence of Aristotelian reversal, recognition, and catharsis. And others who've worked on narrativity in music uh, in the American tradition are uh, Byron Almain and uh, Michael Klein. And the intersections of such amalgams as topics, we think of Ratner, Allenbrook, Agawu, tropes, my own work on troping, or such network-like enrichments of hierarchy through intertextual interactions. Uh, again, Michael Klein's important book in 2005 can take us still further as we will explore in the next section. I would mention here that I uh, completed on January 1st <laughs> an article uh, introducing topic theory um, with some of my own more recent contributions of marketists to topic theory that will be appearing in Res Facta Nova. Uh, Mauv Gorzata Pavlovska is uh, the one who requested that article uh, for that journal. So, three, semiotics as a filter or lens for relevant interdisciplinary borrowing. Semiotics can provide a lens through which we can apply theories developed for other purposes. Interdisciplinary borrowing, however, can be misleading unless we have a clear idea of the boundaries, epistemological and otherwise, of music. And here the rigor of semiotics comes into focus. <clears throat> 
We must respect the productive ways as well as the constraints upon ways that music can emulate other disciplines through its own capacities for signification, as made plausible by analyses and interpretations respecting the principles of relevant musical styles. A common error, and one that has given semiotics a bad reputation, is the, at least among philosophers, is the one-to-one -one mapping of meanings onto musical events, as though music were a simple code of correlations such that overly specific meanings are justified whenever they appear to fit the energetic contours of the musical work. By this metric, music can be taken to mean just about anything. And the fact that it can would suggest that attempting to establish emotional meanings for musical work through testing of untrained listeners would fail to illuminate what I call those aesthetically warranted emotions in a 210, 2010 article that might be more rigorously established. Here, I do not mean to constrain the potential of music to mean beyond historical context of its creation. Theories of reception, histories of performance styles and practices, and the productive implications of those different perspectives can all be relevant to the ongoing reconstruction of a musical works styles and interpretation of its potential meanings. Instead, I would note that some experiences, experiments may tell us more about individual listeners and their biases than about those more intrinsic meanings a musical work makes possible. Nevertheless, one can gain insights from such experiments since they help establish the kinds of perceptual oppositions that ground our cognitive categorizations. I think of the work of Carol Crumhansel on topic theory, for example. But other disciplines may offer still better clues. The theory of marketness, first developed in linguistic theory by Trubetskoy for phonology, then developed by Roman Jakobson and Michael Shapiro for grammar and poetry, is concerned not only with perceptual, but important conceptual oppositions, conceptual oppositions as they help organize grammars, or in our case, styles. For every opposition, there is a potential valuation such that the marked term of the opposition implies a narrower range of meaning. Let's call it X. While the unmarked term is best characterized more neutrally as signifying non-X as opposed to say Y. Markedness is relevant not only to properties, for example, the marked minor versus unmarked minor, unmarked major mode for some styles, such as the classical mode, um, but to processes as well. Within harmonic syntax, a proper cadential resolution to tonic is unmarked with respect to any evasion or deferral of that resolution. And that evasion or deferral will then be marked by carving out a narrower form of expressive meaning just as a chromatic pitch is marked with respect to its substitution for the diatonic pitch that might have appeared. Any such breaking of an implied continuation can be marked more saliently as a rhetorical gesture, as I demonstrated earlier, and hence become expressively focal. The principle of markedness takes us one step beyond Saussure's claim that meaning is difference. It provides a systematic explanation for the relative specification of that difference with respect to meaning, as well as a historical process by which further oppositions can progressively carve out further nuances of meaning. Let's explore how the opening confutatis contrasts with the vocame in measure seven along several musical dimensions. We can see how stylistic oppositions correlate with general meanings, beginning with the marked mode of A minor, which carves out a narrow meaning, perhaps tragic, versus the unmarked mode of C major, which would then be characterized more generally as non-tragic. We need other oppositions to serve to further delineate the expressive potential of that passage in major seven and eight. Here we find 
the opposition between loud versus soft, low versus high register, enhanced by male versus female voices, and a rhythmically energetic versus a more sustained um, high register, excuse me, sustained um, passage, enhanced by the opposition between the initial upward sequencing and what turns out to be a varied repetition as opposed to sequencing. Okay, so all of these oppositions further specify the non-tragic major mode as more serene or even angelic as a plea in response to the hellish agitation of the opening. Then the women's progression as a learned contrapuntal formula also draws in the primal authority of a venerable past style and its simplicity framed by the uh, major third perhaps correlates with a higher pastoral mode as emblematic of purity or sublimity. Both learned and pastoral importations are topical, and their merger here constitutes a trope, a concept I will deal with further below, with respect to music's capacity to create its own metaphors. Music semiotics also draws on history, but history as filtered through culture. In reconstructing, reconstructing an artistic culture within a larger socioeconomic culture, one must be careful to avoid the presumptions of a zeitgeist, namely that a composer is constrained in her options by the concepts that are available either philosophically or scientifically at that time. While a history of musical emotion is indeed possible, Michael Spitzer's 2020 book is a marvelous example of this, and historically warranted emotions provide a kind of rigor in reconstructing how composers might have experienced the emotions they were attempting to stage compositionally. There is also a danger in overly limiting what composers were capable of understanding. The evidence of artistic works may speak volumes for a sensitive interpreter, and we need not rely solely upon contemporaneous treatises or uh, conversations and letters of composers and others to unlock modes and capacities of signification that we could nevertheless defend based on mutually confirming evidence of reconstructed styles and analyzed strategies in a corpus of works. It is also a methodological hazard to assume that a composer necessarily reflects those tensions that are current in her socio-political situation. A composer may decide to address social issues, and there are wonderful examples of such ideological decisions, as when African-American American composer Margaret Bonds incorporates the poetry of Langston Hughes in her songs, I Too, and The Negro Speaks of Rivers in order to promote a more positive image of African Americans and to counter a racist society that had denied their basic humanity. And composers may be unwitting participants in an ide ideology of which they may not be fully aware, as in the opposite case of white composers demeaning or even appropriating the works of other cultures. But we should also allow for the possibility that a composer was not speaking to or especially constrained by a contemporaneous political social situation. For example, as I have argued in my book on gesture, the most important external influence on Schubert in his last five years was Beethoven's music. Schubert's response to Beethoven's example in forging his own retrospectively late style shares a similar concern for interiority, a virtual subjectivity that forms a world of its own for many composers, without regard to external political or ideological circumstances. So basically, I'm saying there's room for both uh, approaches, and but we should not 
uh, foist one on the other where it doesn't seem to be appropriate. Section four, semiotics and hermeneutics, the dialectic of style and work. The example of Marcinus discussed above is especially instructive for music in that it provides a structure for meaning rather than an explicit key to what that meaning might entail. For the latter, semiotics must not only reconstruct a style comprising its own oppositions, but must also implement a hermeneutics, namely a principled approach to interpreting that style as it manifests in an individual composer's choices or strategies within a particular historical context. As I've argued elsewhere in articles in 96 and most recently in Musical Quarterly in 2022, literary hermeneutics as it emerged in the 19th century in the work of Friedrich Schleiermacher already incorporated complementary grammatical and psychological, as he called them, modes of interpretation that roughly correspond to my interaction of style as akin to grammar but with poetics thrown in and strategy as akin to psychology only in the sense of an individual's choices. I have proposed the ongoing interaction between reconstructing a style and interpreting the strategies of works in that style as a methodological dialectic. If semiotics is concerned with the grounding of meaning in a style, with stylistic marketing supporting the correlation of types of musical structures and events with respect to their more general meanings, then hermeneutics explores the strategic marketness developed within individual works and is thus concerned with the interpretation of tokens of more general types. Regardless of how one labels the components of this interaction as two parts of the traditional hermeneutic method, method or a complementary interaction between the goals of a semiotic and a hermeneutic approach, the important point is the interaction itself. This methodological dialectic works like a feedback loop. Interpretations of related strategies lead to generalizations of style types, and established style types guide the further interpretation of strategically varied tokens of those types which lead to the generalization of new types, and so on. This feedback helps us refine our theorization of relevant structures or events, both at the surface and deeper. But it also helps coordinate the kinds of meanings that motivate the continual evolution of those style types as composers seek new forms of expression. So a theory of meaning and a theory of change which we'll get to in a moment here, um, must be mutually implicative. Since Western music lacks the relatively stable lexicon of language, its interpretation involves a constant renegotiation or fine-tuning of the type-token relationships that undergird meaning. Markedness is a powerful tool to coordinate meaning at the systematic, systematic level of a style, and the strategic innovation of new kinds of oppositions can extend this rigor to the work. But there are still other approaches that can help address the uniqueness of a musical work. For example, a musical gesture, as we've just discussed, may constitute a completely fresh amalgam or synthesis of the most basic musical elements as they coalesce into a unique musical event. In searching for helpful analogies from other disciplines, then, it is important to keep a key distinction in mind. Does the other discipline help one illuminate the structuring of an underlying stylistic competency, including its systematic components, or does it have more applicability to individual musical events in a work? and their more flexible realizations of style principles. Apparently unique musical events can only be considered as strategic choices if we propose a style that affords a set of options, 
and that can accommodate further departures as both coherent and expressive. The early theories of distributional linguistics, before Chomsky failed, before Chomsky, distributional linguistics, people like Harris, uh, Chomsky's teacher, failed to recognize deep structures underlying linguistic competency, despite relying on what they thought were objective discovery procedures, which are meticulous surface comparisons and statistical analyses of distributions. Thus, it was not likely that early semiotic approaches, for example, Jean-Jacques Natier in 1975, paralleling pre-Chomskyan linguistic approaches to neutral segmentations of the surface could fare any better for music. Without a robust attention to the reconstruction of style principles, purely structural music analysis would also be likely to overlook significant functions and would be unable to coordinate structure with expression beyond mere surface analogs. As Leonard B. Meyer soon realized, even statistical approaches to expectation, for example, Markov chains and information theory, would not provide access to the functional significance of events with respect to style. The essay you can find in his 1967 collection. Section five, other fruitful interdisciplinary analogs. In my own work as a semiotically inclined music theorist, I have often explored other disciplines to see how they handled theoretical issues that would need to be addressed as part of a foundational approach to the discipline of music theory. With respect to concepts of style and style growth, the subject of my dissertation in 1982, I was intrigued by paleontologists Niles Eldridge's and Stephen Jay Gould's hypothesis of punctuated equilibrium through which they explain the lack of a continuous fossil record, a line of evidence, by positing relatively sudden developmental changes in speciation, followed by much longer periods of relative stasis. Now, by sudden, we might mean 250,000 years, but that's just a second in geological time. Now, the cultural evolution of music, obviously, is more Lamarckian than Darwinian, but it appeared to follow a similar pattern in a far more compressed time scale. And I conjectured that style could be modeled to reflect a comparable differentiation between development and speciation. As translated for music, the distinction would be between style growth, in which a style coherently absorbs innovations and can thus be said to develop, maybe even to the point of mannerism, and style change, for which one would need to construct a new level of style competency or a new hierarchical reorganization of previous levels, and for which one might best understand the style as branching off now into a new species, if you will. The latter would be necessary in order to understand innovations that went beyond the capacity of a prior style to rationalize or explain or use expressively understand expressively. For a perspective on hierarchy, I was inspired by Arthur Kessler's notion of a holarchy, a reconceptualization of hierarchy in which each element was not only a part, but also a whole. For music, one extension would be to consider a given musical event as closed, complete, whole, with respect to lower levels, but open as part of a larger event with respect to higher levels. It's a concept that Eugene Narmour presented as part of his critique of Schenker's theory of voice leading hierarchies in tonal music. I still remember <laughs> a vehement Schenkerian said, how can a musical event be both closed and open? It doesn't make any sense, but it certainly makes sense if you have an expanded notion of hierarchy. In my work on musical meaning in Beethoven in 94, I drew not only from the linguistic concept of markedness, but also from interdisciplinary scholarship on the tropes of metaphor and irony. In 
I demonstrated how a composer might stage a purely musical metaphor and developed this aspect of musical creativity, which is one of the key char characteristics of metaphor. I sought to counter a prevailing tendency in which any musical or any verbal description of expressive meaning in music, for example, sad, was characterized as metaphorical based on cross-domain mapping alone from language to music, in absence of a creative fusion leading to an emergent meaning. My test cases centered on the juxtaposition of topics, relatively stable style types with familiar, if not fixed, expressive associations, in which their juxtaposition, simultaneous or successive within a given functional location, such as a theme, could substitute for a verbally predicated relationship such as this is that in language. Juxtaposition in a functional location, for example, a theme, could by itself prompt an interpretation of the merger between their respective connotations, leading to the creative emergent meaning that is so characteristic of metaphor. My argument was supported by the evidence of a purely visual metaphor, as seen in an article by Noel Carroll in 1994, and the troping of juxtaposed poetic images that also lacked verbal predication. Taking the principle further, I argued that even music syntactical events, such as harmonic progressions, could be subject to tropological interpretations in an article in 2012 and that the very importation of a topic was inherently tropological in an article in 2014. Still other interdisciplinary influences on my work have been mentioned above with respect to gesture, emotion, and agency. Sometimes fruitful analogies may arise from the most unexpected of sources. Music theorists typically recognize Boethius for his translations into Latin that helped preserve ancient Greek music theory. But it was his Consolations of Philosophy in 524 that inspired my conjectures on basic attributes of a robust subjectivity that would have been understood by educated composers and hence available for potential compositional staging a thousand years before the modern subjectivity attributed variously as first emerging in the music of the 16th or 17th centuries. Five, in conclusion, the usefulness of music semiotic perspectives for other disciplines. Music's semiotic status as a sounding temporal form of human aesthetic expression and interaction has proven fascinating across the disciplinary spectrum. One could trace a history of Western music from the early Greek exploration of the mathematical proportions of intervals through acoustic, psychoacoustic, psychological, and cognitive scientific approaches, and from, on the other hand, early metaphysical speculations to current philosophical and aesthetic theories and speculations on all the way to the ideological or political meanings of music complementing or competing with the steady unfolding of practical music theoretical explanations for the emerging complexities of counterpoint, for example, or harmony, tonality, or even post-tonality. Each investigator has been influenced by or consciously attempted to incorporate the relevant interdisciplinary knowledge of their era, developing systems and terminologies that would require careful translation and interpretation on their own by later scholars seeking to incorporate those insights. My own contribution to this entanglement has been to tease out ways in which composers might have staged potential signification for listeners working from what I would consider to be a semiotic axiom that every form is motivated by meaning, which you'll find underlined by Michael Shapiro in his works from 1983 on. And for music, I would say that every meaning is expressively motivated. Every structure is expressively motivated, at least for most styles. No truisms here for, that apply universally. My recent work on levels of virtual agency for music in 2018 book 
may offer a compelling alternative to a simplistic concept of a unitary persona that some music philosophers have disparaged, and probably rightly so. Stephen Davies, for example. And it may suggest another hypothesis for music psychologists, such as Patrick Jusselin and Daniel Vestfiel, to explore in accounting for how listeners come to understand music's expressivity as what I would call virtualized emotion. Thank you. The next four slides contain my bibliography. We will show each slide about 10 seconds to allow you time to scan and or uh, take pictures.